Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mosia Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to this special edition of Newsmakers, the best of living here. I'm Fred Martino. Today we take a look at historic sites to visit in southern New Mexico. We cover a vast area starting with the abandoned ghost town of Lake Valley just south of Hillsboro. Then we visit the historic Rio Grande Theater in downtown Las Cruces where we discover a lot of memories from those who used to visit the theater. We travel to Truth or Consequences to explore a 40-year historical collection of Sierra County. And in Silver City, we visit a Victorian-style home turned into the city's museum. Finally, we visit and admire a remarkable automobile collection in an airplane hangar in Santa Teresa. So here at Lake Valley, New Mexico, we're actually at the third town site for Lake Valley. The first two were destroyed by floods. Um, so Lake Valley got its start in about 1876 when they discovered silver ore in their area. And it depends on who's telling the story, whether it's two ranchers or two cowboys. It did pretty well for mining. What took it out because the U.S. Mint wasn't buying silver anymore. and once they couldn't make money mining silver, there wasn't really a good reason to stick around. And then it became a ghost town. The last inhabitants of Lake Valley left in 1994. One of the more interesting stories um, about Lake Valley is its claim to fame. It's called the Bridal Chamber. It's a chamber that they found while mining for silver, and inside that chamber, the silver ore was so pure that they were able to ship it directly from the mine to the U.S. Mint. A portion of that was put on display at the World's Fair during that time, so it was kind of a big deal. Um, and fully half of all silver mined here at Lake Valley came from the bridal chamber. Lake Valley, it kind of started as a money-making scheme like a lot of other Old West mining towns did. And one of the men that was involved in that was a British man. And he was actually put on trial in uh, the UK for fraud. At his trial, when he was convicted and found guilty, he bit down on a cyanide pill and killed himself right there in the courtroom. So how's that for some drama? <laughs> So there are various myths and legends attached to Lake Valley, just like any ghost town in the Old West. One of those people, um, her name is Sadie Orchard. She arrived here, I believe, a little bit after the mining boom had stopped. She ran her own stagecoach service that connected Lake Valley to Hillsboro and Kingston. And Kingston owned a hotel and brothel. So she was quite the businesswoman. She had quite the reputation as being a very feisty character. <laughs> That's one of the more colorful characters that you can learn about here at Lake Valley. So for visitors who want to come and visit Lake Valley, if you're coming from Las Cruces on I-25, you can take the hatch exit and take New Mexico Route 26 until you reach Nut and make a right onto New Mexico Route 27, and that'll get you to Lake Valley. The site here is open from Wednesday until Sunday. That's when the caretakers are here to uh, open the gate um, if you're arriving by car. 
However, you can, because this is part of your public lands, you can visit anytime um, as long as you're on foot. The amenities that we have to offer are a uh, picnic area. We have a, a brand new public vault toilet. Uh, very nice, adds to the convenience of visiting a Lake Valley. We also have various walking trails. We have a self-led tour, um, and you can see a really good example of what schoolhouses in southern New Mexico looked like in the early 1900s. So as far as handicap access goes, we are in the planning stages of putting in an ADA accessible ramp and we are going to be putting in more wheelchair friendly paths so that it, the whole site can be accessible to everyone. When people come to visit Lake Valley, they can expect to see um, old buildings dating anywhere from the late 1880s to around 1950 or so. Um, a lot of the buildings have been here for a while and as people lived here, they would add on to them and add on to them and add on to them. So you'll see different building styles over time. Um, so it's really a, a nice record of um, what buildings looked like in a residential town um, in southern New Mexico in the late 1800s and early 1900s. I would say the best time to come visit Lake Valley is probably towards the fall. That way you avoid the high temperatures of summertime and also you avoid the windy season. It does get very windy here at Lake Valley and that's actually one of the main causes of destruction and degradation to our buildings is just the sheer force of the wind. So if you want to come to Lake Valley and make the most of your time, I would say maybe come in, in around fall. Well, the Rio Grande Theater is the last operating two-story adobe theater in the country. And it's on the National Register of Historic Places. It's been given several other distinctions. The other thing that's important, and I don't know if, that you can see around uh, the interior of the building here, is when we were doing the renovation, we uncovered these beautiful murals downstairs. And they are actually the crests of the first families of New Mexico. The theater went out of operation in the early 1930s when the building actually burned down, and or most of it burned down, and it had to be renovated. And then again in uh, 1998, it stopped running movies, and it became dormant. And at that time, it became the uh, property of the Doniana Arts Council, and we were the people who raised the money to renovate it. That's when they were starting to renovate the Rio Grande and I thought that was awesome that they would be doing it. I had never seen it as I grew up as a child and then to see the interior, all that, the beautiful work that is on all around the stage and to be able to keep up the traditions of the Rio Grande Theater and to maintain a beautiful structure, that was what was the most memorable part and really appreciate the Rio Grande Theater. My in-laws' uh, family holds uh, a production around Christmas time called Los Pastores, and uh, we were able to hold it in the Rio Grande Theater now. And just to see the renovations that were done and that, and it brings back great memories. Uh, I see the theater now and I think about it every time I walk in there, about the difference the theater is now then I remember it then. Uh, good times in Cruces, good times at the Rio Grande.
the heyday was during the 50s and 60s when the kids would go up and down May Street. This was the first run movies. It was the only place in town that really had the best movies, the best food uh, you know, in terms of the theater food. And that's what people speak really fondly of. I can smell the popcorn, I can see Elvis. That's what we nicknamed him, the, the, the concession manager that was there. He had big old pork chop sideburns and we called him Elvis. The Rio Grande was, you know, the lights and the, and the smell of the popcorn uh, cooking, baking, whatever they do, popping, and the, and the candies, uh, the licorice, and anyway, it was, it was a memorable day for us. This is really a community center. Uh, we call it a performing arts center, and it's used for dance, music, theater, uh, movies, but for the most part, it is a, a multi-purpose venue uh, for local groups. And so even though the theater only seats 426 people, it is still beloved by so many people. Uh, people have so many fond memories. They come and tell us stories about working here or having their first date here, that kind of thing, bringing their families here. So many very good, uh, vivid memories. As a young man walking all the way from campus to go see several different movies when that was the only show in town. I am currently with a woman who we went on our first date together in 1982. We went and saw a movie. It just makes me get all googly inside. My granny Bloxham lived on 3rd Street. That's quite a distance from the Rio Grande, but on Saturdays, I'd stay overnight with Granny. Cousin B and I would walk to the Rio Grande Theater. Uh, we happened to have my nephew with us, and he's 10 years younger than us, so he was quite the little fellow when we walked to the Rio Grande Theater. It was a Disney program. I don't remember the program itself. He had never been to a movie before like that. He was in awe. His eyes were deer in the headlight kind of thing. And my cousin and I found, wound up watching him more than the movie because he was in awe of that Rio Grande Theater. So as far as the future, I just think it continues to be that place that is the home to many community groups and the place where we can bring in uh, top quality artists uh, to give to give Las Cruces uh, the best entertainment that they can have. We house the local history, we curate the local history, we take care of it, and we make it available for the community or for tourists who are coming looking for information on the area. It's been here quite a while. It's over 45 years old. It's a community museum and the things have been given by our community. We have one of the finest pottery collections in the area and that's probably our most valuable collections of what's prehistoric. Arrowheads also, they have been documented and researched by people from other museums. We are totally nonprofit. We're a 501c3. We are owned by the Sierra County Historical Society, so our means of, of keeping going is constant fundraising and constant volunteering. In the gift shop, we have a lot of consignees that are local, so we don't have to buy up front. We can, and we promote this way, we promote local artists. But the consignees are extremely important, and I think at last count there were over 60 consignees in the gift shop, and they all have a local connection. One of the main missions of the museum is is education, of course, and so we hope that a person comes here and we hope that they understand the history and how people lived previous, in previous days. And also, by virtue of our displays, we hope that this encourages people to stay a few more days.
Then our research department that we put together in the last few years is very good because genealogy is probably the first or second most popular hobby in the United States today. And so we get people who are looking for their roots, so to speak, and if they are not in a hurry. They are interested in staying here and finding out where great-grandfather's ranch was or where he was buried. Or, and so by our research department, by virtue of that, we can keep them in the area for, for another several days or weeks and interest people perhaps in moving here. It's, it's all community oriented. It's all about community and volunteers. And I think this is what makes it so special. And kids love museums. It, it, they don't think they're going to, but then they do when they find out that they're, what it's all about. Then the log cabin has really, really helped with that because everybody's excited to go in the log cabin. It's $6 per person. If we have a family of six or something like that, we cap it at $15. So if uh, aunt, auntie and uncle and, and grandpa and grandma come to, uh, the, we cap it at $15. And that's mainly for families with children so that uh, the fee doesn't become something that's prohibitive. It's 211 Main. It's in the downtown part of Tier C. We're open seven days a week. Uh, on Sunday, we don't open until noon. They can go to our website. We also have Facebook. The best way is to come by. This building is a critical piece of Silver City history. It was built by the Aylman family in the 1880s. And the Aylmans were immigrants from the East Coast. They came from York, Pennsylvania. Eventually in the 1870s, he struck it rich in a silver mine here in Silver City. And to show off his newfound wealth, he built this house in the Victorian style in 1881 and lived here for a few years until there was a huge bank and uh, fiscal depression in the United States. He then left the building, sold it to another family, and moved west. Later it became a boarding house to house a lot of the young men who were working in the mines here in Silver City. And after that, it became the firehouse for the town of Silver City. Then the Silver City Town Hall, and about 50 years ago, the town gave it to a group of concerned citizens in Silver City who created the Silver City Museum. And since 1967, it's been the museum for the town and the county. Part of the house is restored or recreated to suggest what it was like living in Silver City in 1880. And other parts of the house offer exhibits on mining, on the great flood that really reshaped downtown uh, Silver City, or in this case, uh, where I'm standing in the ranching exhibit. So it's a mix of public program spaces, exhibit spaces, and sort of a time travel space where you can walk into the parlor and imagine yourself living in the heyday of uh, Silver City's uh, mining history. Local residents who were in love with the idea of creating a museum for this town donated objects. Um, various photographic collections came our way. So almost 
100% of the objects that are in the collection of the museum were gifted to us by local members of the community. And part of that house is a cupola, or a lookout at the top floor. It was used to help cool the house, so in the hot weather those windows would be opened and the hot air would just flow up, up and out. But it also provides a beautiful vantage point. You can see 360 degrees, you get the best view of Silver City from our cupola. And one of the most important views is looking south. And what you see when you look out the cupola south, you see a hill called Chihuahua Hill. And on top of that hill is a beautiful little chapel called La Capilla. It was built by two very devout sisters who were part of that Mexican-American community. They built a chapel to honor Our Lady of Guadalupe. The first chapel uh, was torn down in 1914, and the present chapel, built on the exact same spot, was built in the early 2000s. Most recently, we've been showing off uh, those objects we have that document the really rich history of ranching here in Grant County, and that's what we have behind us. Uh, saddles that were made by a local saddle maker who was renowned throughout the region, very beautiful works of art. And we have uh, the more utilitarian objects like uh, the iron brands that were used to mark cattle here in, in the region. So we have a great collection of, of, of wide-ranging materials. We have close to 100 people who volunteer here at the museum. And they do all kinds of things, whether it's helping sort and manage our collections, offer school programs for kids, greet visitors at our front desk, or help in our gift shop. We could not exist if it wasn't for our volunteers. Our gift shop is just fantastic. There's so many unique objects you can find in our gift shop. Almost all of our programs are offered free to the public, which means anybody can take part in it. And they happen all the time. There's usually two or three events happening every month here at the Silver City Museum. The museum is located at 312 West Broadway, right here in downtown Silver City. The museum is free. We are open Tuesday through Sunday from 9.30 to 4.30. They can find us on Facebook, they can find us on Instagram, or they can go to our website, www.silvercitymuseum.org. I think learning about the richness of Silver City. It's a small town, but it's very, very diverse. There are ranching families, Hispanic families, mining families, uh, artists, there's a very strong artist community here in Silver City, and that richness really makes this Silver City Museum something unique and very fun to work at. The automobile collection of War Eagles Air Museum has um, evolved over a period of time, in fact over the last 25 years. Many of these automobiles were the personal collection of John and Betty McGuire, but also uh, several of the vehicles were donated by people that might have passed away during the last 25 years. We've always felt here at War Eagles Air Museum that uh, part of our mission was to preserve and restore and display not only aviation uh, airplanes, but automobiles as well. Here at War Eagles, we have worked very hard to promote and, and make the visitor experience much more comfortable and enjoyable. We installed six 24-foot ceiling fans to make uh, the winters warmer and the summers cooler. Uh, we've worked hard also to make all of the displays much more presentable. They're clean and they shine.
We have some lovely vehicles in the collection. Uh, probably the star of the show might be our 36 Packard convertible and the 35 Auburn. I love them all, but the favorite I really have is the 36 Packard. Not only because of the car itself, but the history behind it. I'm told that the 36 Packard was the type of automobile that John McGuire owned at one time during his lifetime. And as it turned out, he had to sell that car and Mrs. McGuire, Betty McGuire, ended up restoring one just like that for him for their anniversary. We have a desire to uh, attract all of the volunteers that we can, but primarily what you see here at War Eagles Air Museum is done by volunteers. Uh, you can uh, volunteer here at War Eagles for various jobs within the organization, for everything from sweeping floors to cleaning airplanes. It's all important. For more information about War Eagles Air Museum, uh, you can go to our website www.war-eagles-air-museum.com or uh, look at our Facebook page. Thanks for joining us for the best of living here. This program is only possible because of our producers, Joe Widmer, Ralph Escandone and Christian Viang. Thanks guys. Subscribe to KRWG News on YouTube so you never miss a segment. And if you have an idea for the team, send us an email. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Thanks for being with us.